it's one way to get an, an, a policy, for example, but it's another way to make sure that it's actualized, for example, it's implemented. So I was wondering from your experience, maybe you can share with us what um, are some of the things that when someone is, maybe an organization is trying to push a policy, for example, what are some of the things that they should consider? Because I'm thinking not all policies that are suggested are necessarily going to work. So what should an organization that is trying to push um, a, a given policy, for example, what should they do? What should they consider to make that policy become a success? Yeah. Um, well, in in order to get it designed right in the first place, mm -hmm. I mean, it's good to have to be very active about precisely how what it, what it is a policy you're using. Then you can use examples if you have, if you have examples from other areas that have worked. Mm -hmm. That's a good cause. Um, we've also tried to always have allies supporting it. So when we went in for a goal of 60% organic in the pub, all public kitchens, yeah. we, we came together with the trade unions representing the people who were working in the kitchens yeah. and with health organizations. And so, so, so good allies shows politicians that there's broad support yeah. for this issue. It's not just the organic producers mm. who want to sell more stuff. Um, and it's also helps design things better because different interests, you know, they have a different perspective on, you know, what the policy needs to look like. So then you end up with policy that is more tailored to the actual needs. Yeah. So, yeah. so we had a lot of discussion with these, you know, the people who were actually working in the public kitchens and they're, you know, people try to lead these large hospital kitchens and so on. What kind of policies will support you? And then we designed it on that basis. Mm. But then it was much easier to implement because it was made because it in a way that it made sense for the people who actually had to do it. Yeah. Um, and then implementation also requires follow up with ministries and with, you know, design of programs and um, dissemination of programs. I'm doing some advising with the ministry in Uganda right now, and they have the new organic law, yeah. um, which is fantastic i mean it's just the the elements described in there and the the ngos in uganda have done a great job you know yeah. really making sure there's a lot of good things in there but now the real work comes because it has to get financed mm. and it has to all the all the design on the on the programs and so on so there's always yeah i mean there's always a lot of work in, yeah. in the follow-up but then that's where the real change happens yeah talking yeah. about policy again i would like to get your um, opinion on the um, right now the folk to um farm to fork strategy of the European Union where they have a target of um, 25% organic land yeah. by 2030. What what do you think about it? Do you think it's um, in the right path of um, being achieved before 2030 or by 2030? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the organic movement, IFOM, uh, Organics Europe, yeah. did an amazing job, you know, lobbying for strong goals, but also strong substance that's also reflected in the new action plan, um, yeah. the organic action plan. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it requires reaching 25% requires a whole range of organic policies in all of the member states. Yeah. And the commission has sent a signal that member states should, should do action plans for organics. I wish they would have required it yeah. um, because in some states, you know, our organizations are small and they, we really need the ministries to be committed to doing organic action plans. It's kind of a platform to, mm. to hear the organic sector. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we need besides, you know, market development and training for farmers and extension services and other issues, we definitely need some game changers. Yeah. Um, and one of those in the member states is redirecting uh, agricultural support to the environmental and climate issues that organic farmers are already doing a lot of, that will change mm -hmm. the face of agriculture in Europe overnight yeah. if it's done seriously in the in the different member states. And then I think we need some game changers to level the playing field in the market also, like pesticide fees. We have pesticide fees in Denmark, which have, you know, it's adds some some it makes the sort of the polluter pays reflected mm. in the price. Yeah. And it's also helping farmers, you know, move away from some of those pesticides anyway. Um, and then with, you know, the VAT, I mean, I think, you know, that sh the EU can start by saying that it's okay for member states to differentiate for organic yeah. products and set the VAT lower on organic food. Yeah. Um, and then of course the member states need to do it. Yeah. That would level the playing field. I mean, if we had a, 
in Denmark, we have a VAT of 25%. Mm. If that was cut in half for organics, we would have a number of organic products that actually would be cheaper yeah. than the conventional products. We would take 100% of the market That's for a number of, number of products yeah. immediately. Sure. And it, just like now, you know, it's sort of like, you know, with some, some products are being phased out conventional in, in Denmark now, like bananas, for example. We have, we've gone from, in one year, we went from like 30% of the market to 66 and now we're probably moving towards 100% of the market because they're just they're they're phasing out conventional bananas. Yeah. Um, so you know the VAT issue would do that for a lot of products. Mm. Um, so yeah, game changers. We need those too.